Hey, I have the gift of encouragement. You guys know that. I want to encourage you every chance I get. Dude, you only got nine days left. If you ain't started your shopping, you're backing up now, okay? I haven't started mine either, okay? But he only got nine days left. How many of you have ever had to travel at Christmas time? Raise your hand. Had to travel. Had to go to grandma's house or your in-law's house or your brother or sister's house, but you had to travel. You understand who started this whole idea of traveling at Christmas? It was the wise guys. The wise guys. The wise men, they traveled to see Jesus, which was literally the very first Christmas travel. And if you think about it, we have a lot in common with the wise men, the way they traveled and, and the way we traveled. You know, they, 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 they didn't stop and ask for directions until they got to Jerusalem, and most men won't stop and ask for directions. So we have that in common, right? They, they, what? We do, right? Why? Yeah. And, you know, and, and we don't camp with camels, but we've been known to knock elbows with knobby kneed aunts or uncles on the way to the bathroom. That's about the same thing, right? Um, we, we don't keep an eye out. We don't watch for a star. But I can tell you every man in this room is watching his rearview mirror for blue lights <laughs> all the way to grandma's house. We do that. Just, you know, we do. And we don't ride on the the Spice Road caravan, but a lot of us spend six, seven, eight hours in a minivan with four screaming kids, and I think the, that's, that's got to be hard, I think, you know, it's got to be hard that we do, and it isn't fun, and it isn't games, it's not all fun and games, traveling at Christmas time, would you agree? It isn't, I mean, spending an extended period of time in a car with people brings out some strange stuff. It really does. I mean, here's the first thing, like I said, dads, we're not going to stop for anything. We have a rule. If you have to pee, you wait till the tank's empty, and we'll stop at a gas station. If you don't like the bathroom in that gas station, you can wait till the tank's empty again. I mean, that's the way, way dads are, right? And the reason is because we go back to our forefathers. They never stopped and asked for directions. I guarantee you that John Smith didn't stop at the mouth of the James River and ask where Jamestown was. He didn't, you know. And Lewis and Clark never, ever asked for directions. They just went. And, and, and I guarantee you that when Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem, he didn't stop along the way so she could check out the souvenir shops. They went where they had what? They went where they had to go, Right? We do that. Men drive like we have a biblical mandate to get from point A to point B. And then you got the children to deal with. And that's always fun. Well, with kids, there's something that I call JBA. And that's really important. That's juvenile bladder activity. Okay? Now, kids at home, they'll go a week without using the bathroom. We got a grandbaby that, that uh, uh, we share with Pastor Rabbit and Caroline, Christopher. And he's over at our house. Christopher, you got to use the bathroom? No. Christopher, you got to use the bathroom? No. All day long, you got to use the bathroom? No. You put that kid in a car, and every 10 miles, you got to stop because he's got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> That's the way we travel, you know? That's the way we travel. And then praise God, you don't have teens. Huh? Because <laughs> if you got teens, listen to me, dads, moms, they will be judging you and be embarrassed about the way you talk, the way you dress, the way you act, what you eat, and the way you sing to the radio, okay? And you better not fire them up too much because one day they're going to have grandbabies and they can decide whether or not you get to see them, okay? So I would say just don't even travel with teens. Probably, thinking about it, it's probably most wise, wisest, wi wisest. It's probably wisest to postpone any travel to your kids are 42, and, and, and that'll work. But, you know, from the very beginning of Christmas, Travel has been prompted, and it really began with, with the wise men. We're in a series that I started, I guess, about three weeks ago now that I'm calling Christmas Characters, and what we've been doing, what we've been looking at are the characters in the Christmas story, but a little differently. We've been looking at them as if we were in their shoes. What did they see? How did they feel? What did they say? What did they do? And I think that's given us a whole new perspective on the whole Christmas story. We started the series off with the most obscure of Christmas characters. 
a guy named Simeon and a lady named Anna. We don't even think about them. They're not in the nativity scene. You don't see them standing around the manger. In fact, they were not part of that magnificent night at all. But they were part of the Christmas story because God had promised to both of them that they would see the Messiah. And so that was important. Then we looked a week at, um, at Mary. And we talked about what the truth is about Mary. Because what the world tells us about Mary and what the Bible tells us about Mary are two different things. And they're really diametrically opposed. And we talked about who Mary was and the fact that when she agreed to God's plan, she was never the same again. Last week we talked about smelly shepherds. Smelly shepherds we called them because... Because shepherds were considered as low as lepers because of the way they smelled and because of the job they had to, had to perform. And so we talked about that. This week, we are going to talk about these guys who traveled, these guys who went out of their way to see the baby Jesus. Problem was, what we know about the, the wise men, what we think we know about the wise men, what the world tells us about the wise men, is not what God says about the wise men. It's not what the Bible says about them. So what we're going to do today is we're going to try to figure out the truth about the wise men. How many of you brought your Bibles this morning? Raise them up. New school, tablet, phone, old school, hardback, softback. It's important that you bring your Bibles. You know why? Because I don't want you to believe a stinking word I ever tell you. Remember, I've said that every week almost. Don't believe what I tell you. Go look it up in God's word. Learn it for yourself. Because what you think you know the Bible says, and what the Bible says a lot of times are not the same thing. And I'm going to prove that several times this morning, okay? But we want to be a people that are known to have God's word in our heart. And the only way you get it into your heart is you've got to read it. And then it makes that 12 to 18 inch journey from your brain to your heart. But we want to be known as people who know God's word. I think that is so, so important. You know, unlike the wise men, though, we don't have to travel to find Jesus. And that's cool. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 13 and 14 said, Say, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me, and I will be found by you, says the Lord. God says that we don't have to take the journey that the wise men took. We don't have to take the small journey that the smelly shepherds took. We don't have to do anything but seek him. And when we seek him within our own hearts and ask him to come into our lives and to be our savior, he's there. He's there. That is so important. So what I want us to do, I want us to look at this whole biblical account of the wise men. I will tell you up front, Matthew is the only gospel, gospel that records the story of the wise men. Luke doesn't. None of the other gospels do. And that's going to be important when we finish reading this. But I'm going to read the first 12 verses of the second chapter of Matthew. And here's the story of the wise men. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called the meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote, and they quote, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of, Ju Ju of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you, from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. 
Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. That's the biblical account of the wise guys, okay? Everything we know about this group of people, we know from the second chapter of Matthew. Now, I want to start by kind of listing some things we don't know. Things we don't know about these guys, okay? Things we don't know. Number one, we don't know how many there were. Oh, wait a minute, Pastor Steve. There were three. We three kings up. No. We don't know. We don't know how many they were. The number three comes from the gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But I got to tell you something. For such a trip as they took, it couldn't have been three of them. They would never got there. In order to get from point A to point B with these guys, it would have taken a caravan to get them there. It would have taken a number of servants. It would have taken a number of camels. It would have taken a number of, of guards and assistants. In fact, when you think about it, there may have been somewhere between a couple, three dozen, all the way up to maybe a hundred people traveling together. Not three wise men, okay? Where were they from? We don't know. We have no idea where they came from. Well, the Bible says they came from the east. East of Jerusalem is the whole rest of the world, okay? Because the world is round. So we don't know where they came from. But here's what we do know. The Bible uses the term magi. That's a specific term. That term is Persian, and it's also Babylonian. And in both languages, it means basically a wise scientist, someone who studies the heavens, who studies stars, uh, someone who's smart, okay? That's where we get that idea of wise men from, okay? The next question is, how far did they travel? We don't know. We ain't got a clue. We know they came from the east, you know? It's kind of like they could have come from East Portsmouth to West Portsmouth. We don't know, right? But we think, based on the terms that were used, we think based on a lot of, a lot of people doing a lot of research in God's Word, anywhere from 500 miles away to 1,500 miles away. They weren't driving a car. They weren't flying in an airplane. They weren't riding a train. They were walking, okay? How long did it take them? We don't know. Depends on how far they came from, right? But most biblical scholars think somewhere between one and two years after the birth of Jesus. So let me stop right here. How many of you have a nativity scene at home? Raise your hand. How many of you have the three wise men in that nativity scene? Yeah. You know that's not scriptural. The wise men did not show up at the manger. I don't care what people tell you, physically impossible unless they were transported like Star Wars to the manger. It didn't happen. The star they saw rose and shined the night the baby was born. They had to prepare for the journey. Then they had to make the journey. It could have taken up to two years. So they're not in your nativity scene. Go home, take the wise men out of your nativity scene, and put them on the shelf in your kitchen. Okay? <laughs> now we have to confess, the nativity scene we have out in the lobby only has the wise men in it. So <laughs> what can I say? What can I say? All right? Next question, were they kings? We don't know. We don't think so. Wait a minute, we three kings, no. We don't know if they were kings, probably not. There was a church father, church historian, um, Tertullian, Tertullian, I think I'm pronouncing it right. He said in the 6th century that they were kings because of a biblical prophecy in the Old Testament that says kings would come and worship him. But we don't know that for sure. We don't know. The Bible doesn't say they were kings. And even though we don't know a whole lot about these guys, we know some stuff. We know some stuff. They, 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 they came. They, they wanted to find the baby. They wanted to see the Messiah. That we do know. We also know they were Gentile. 
They certainly weren't Jewish, but they came seeking the Messiah. So I think there's some lessons we can learn from the wise guys, even though we don't know a whole lot. See, now, you can go home and tell, tell your friends you know a whole lot now more about the wise men than you did before that's really biblical. And a lot of the stuff we think about the wise men isn't biblical at all. But we can learn some lessons. Let me go ahead and go into that, okay? Three lessons we can learn. First one's real easy. The wise seek him. The wise seek him. It's a funny thing that happens when we actually sit down and start to read our Bible. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot. But I want you to think back. When was the last time you just sat down, opened your Bible, and, and read from it? Okay? Because there's a funny thing that happens when you do that. Listen, seriously, when you sit down and you read your Bible, you realize what is really true, and amazingly, you realize how much stuff you don't know. Just like this stuff about the, the, the wise men. But it takes you time. You have to stop and read it. How many of you know that the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Raise your hand. You know that's not what the Bible says. It isn't. Here's what the Bible really says, John 8, 31 and 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples. Get this. If you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See, the statement I ask you about, how many you know, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, doesn't cause you, cause you to have to do anything. It doesn't require you to do anything. But what the Bible says, if, if you're true to my teachings, if you know my word, if you are my follower, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Difference, right? Totally different. But you wouldn't know that unless you read it. It's just amazing how much stuff you realize you don't know do you read it? And I got to tell you what, guys, I, I, I'm ashamed to tell you, or maybe I'm excited to tell you. Every time I sit down and open my, my Bible, I have an epiphany. Because I'll see that when I go, wow, I didn't see that before. Or that's not the way I remember it. And it happens all the time. I would encourage you to go have some epiphany moments in the Bible. Okay? And really get amazed about what you don't know about what God's Word says. Anyway, you got that free. It wasn't part of the sermon. We'll move on. All right. I said that because that's what's so true about the wise men. We assume all this stuff about the wise men that aren't really true at all. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men, taking notes, circle that. Some. The word three is spelled T-H-R-E-E. -E. The word in God's word is S-O-M-E. Some, okay? Some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. You know, the fact that the wise men are in this story is not significant at all until you put it all together. What book are we reading this out of? Tell me. Somebody tell me. Matthew. Who wrote Matthew? It's not a trick, trick question. Who wrote the book of Matthew? Matthew. Matthew. Who was Matthew? Huh? He was a disciple. He was also Jewish, right? Matthew intended to write his gospel to the Jews or to the Messianic Jews, Jews who had, who had believed in the Messiah. That was his intent when he wrote the, the, the gospel of Matthew to the Jews. I find it really significant that his only story about the birth of the Messiah are Gentiles going to worship Jesus. That's got to be important, guys. That's a big deal. Why? Because I'm going to connect some dots for you that you've probably never heard before. But listen to me. That's a big deal. That is significant that Matthew chose to write about these guys. Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus doesn't include a manger. It doesn't include the, the smelly shepherds. It doesn't include Joseph. Mary's there, but not Joseph. It's a completely different writing about the birth of the Messiah. And that's significant as we go forth, okay? So just hang on to that, and we're going to get there, all right? Why did he want you to know about Gentile wise men seeking the Messiah? Here we go. 
back in the Old Testament, there was a prophet. His name was Daniel. Y'all remember Daniel? Okay. Daniel in the lion's den, that Daniel. All right. Now, Daniel, Daniel was supposed to be a very wise man. And Daniel was set up in charge of a group of very wise men. Okay? They were Chaldean wise men. Okay? From the area of Persia and Babylonia. A lot of theologians connect the dots between Daniel and these wise men. That they were descendants of, ancestors of, this original group of astrologers, of wise men, that Daniel was at one time their leader. A Jewish prophet, their leader. So you start to connect the dots. That, I think, is amazing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. So what we've said so far are all these things about these wise men that we thought were true, but we noticed they, they weren't true at all. Then we connect the dot to Daniel. This is not in your outline. It's not on your screens. Daniel chapter 2, verse 48. It says, then the king appointed Daniel to a high position. Listen to this. To a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. Listen. He made Daniel ruler over the whole providence of Babylon, okay, as well as the chief over all his wise men. Dot, 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 dot. Now, dot, 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 dot. I think, I think it's a good assumption. I think it's biblically sound to say these men somehow are connected to Daniel. And if so, they came from an area around Babylon, which, by the way, is east of Jerusalem, just to kind of help you out there, okay? It's a little east of Jerusalem. Now, one of the things we assume, assume about the wise men that is kind of sort of true is they did come because of a star, okay? In the, in the second verse of Matthew, he says, they said, where's the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. I think it's important to notice they didn't ask if the king had been born. They said, where is he? They made the assumption they knew correctly that the Messiah had already been born, no doubt about it. And this star has something to do with letting them know. But this star is no ordinary star. We're going to talk about that in a minute, too. It's not an ordinary star. It's not. Now, some of the things that we see happening as we, as we walk through all of this, King Herod plays a role in he plays a significant role in this story, and he's not in the Luke version of the story at all. But the Bible tells us that they went to the king, and they said, where is the Messiah? They must have assumed and believed that he had been born, and this had to shock King Herod. I mean, this had to make him shake in his boots when they asked that. You know why? Because they said specifically, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Well, Herod was king of the Jews. But he wasn't born king of the Jews. He was politically appointed by the Roman government. He wasn't a rightful heir to the throne. And if a child had been born that is king of the Jews, he is a direct threat to his throne, a direct threat to his ruling of the Jewish people. So that's kind of important to think about. And these wise guys are the ones that create the threat by talking to him about it. And I think it's also that you, you see the connection between them and Daniel and all of that. Matthew, Matthew wants us to see this. He wants us to see that wise men were seeking the Messiah. Wise men were seeking the Messiah. What do we learn from that? If we are wise, we seek the Messiah. Another thing we learn from the story of the wise men is this. Fools try to oppose him. Fools try to oppose him. 
And I, when I read that and thought about that, I, I thought about A-Team and most of you, the younger guys in the room, you ain't got a clue what I'm talking about, but I pity the fool, okay? <laughs> Fools oppose him. You see, in, in, in Matthew's narrative of this amazing event, not everybody was happy. Not everybody was excited. Not everybody had enthusiasm that the Messiah had been born. The Bible says that, that Herod was really upset about it. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 3. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Wait a minute. Nobody was happy that the baby had been born? Nobody was happy that the king of the Jews was there? No. They were upset about it. The people were upset because they knew Herod was upset. And that was a big deal. You see, Herod the Great could cause life to be miserable for everybody. He was a tyrant. He was a, he was a hard ruler. He took away their freedoms. He took away their liberties. And he was a weird guy. Let me tell you some of the stuff about Herod. Number one, I said he wasn't the rightful heir to the throne to start with. So that made him feel threatened. Number two, the Jews hated him. They hated him for who he was and how he treated them. They were hoping somebody would come bump him off the throne. Okay? They, they wanted that. And, and, and number three, Herod did not want a religious people getting excited and uniting around a religious leader. They didn't, he didn't want that to happen. See, the people in Jerusalem were disturbed because they knew Herod would get upset. And that meant that he would take it out on them. And so they were worried about that. You see, Herod, Herod was a hardcore guy. Between 7 B.C. and 4 B.C., he had three of his own children murdered because he thought they opposed him. At one point, he rounded up all these political people and religious leaders such as scribes and Pharisees and had them all executed because he thought they were trying to undermine his rule. This is the kind of person that Herod was. So the people in Jerusalem realized if Herod gets upset, we're going to have problems. It's going to be hard on us. Matthew chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, it says, He, Herod, called the meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Their response, In Bethlehem in Judea. They said, For this is what the prophet wrote. O you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Now, understand something. He called together the religious leaders to ask what's going on, right? He's a Jew. He should have known. I guess he was a nominal Jew, kind of like nominal Christians go to church on Easter and Christmas, that kind of thing. Well, Herod was a Jew. He should have known, but he didn't. He probably didn't know as much about it as the wise men who came from the East. He didn't know. So it says he called together a group. Let me tell you who he called together. It's a group called the Sanhedrin. Okay? 71 men make up the Sanhedrin, and that's the Jewish Senate and the High Court. Together, they're the Sanhedrin. They are the religious authorities. They are the theological authorities in Jerusalem. And so he asked them. They told him. They, they told him exactly what was going on. The thing I notice here is, yeah, he's supposed to be born. You know, he's supposed to be born. He's supposed to be born in, in Bethlehem. They're not excited. They could care less. But you got this group of wise men from the east who are Gentiles, and they're tripping all over themselves because they want to see this king. And they traveled up to 1,500 miles to see him. And the Sanhedrin is in Jerusalem, right outside of Bethlehem. And they could care less if the Messiah was born. It says a lot, doesn't it? It, it says a lot. It says a lot. It, to me, it just does. This wasn't good news for Herod, though. Mm. This was not good news. In fact, he hatches a plan. Matthew chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. When Herod called, then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men. Stop there. Why was it private? Why did he do that? Because he certainly didn't want the religious leaders knowing what he was asking and what he was plotting to do, okay? This was a plot. He called them together privately, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me 
so I can go and worship him too. Liar, liar, pants on fire. It's not going to happen, okay? We know exactly what he wants to do. He wants to take out, remove, eliminate, cease to exist any threat to his throne. Okay? So this is a plot. This is a plot. Because you see, if what the wise men said was true, and if what the chief priest and the Pharisees and the scribes were saying was correct in their interpretation of the scripture, his, ta his time on the throne was numbered. His days as the king was, was numbered. So he decided to use the wise men to make his task easier. He decided to use them to find who this baby was that he wanted so so to pay homage to, right? We know, we know from the scripture that he was so harsh, that he was so hard, that he issued a decree later to have every male child under the age of two executed to eliminate the threat to his throne. And you know what? It's been 2,000 however many years since this, and people ain't changed. There are still people every day that oppose Jesus, openly oppose him. And you know something? I love what the Bible calls them. Because, you know, I'm, kind of, I'm one of these really lovable, I want to touch you, hold you, squeeze you, feely, encouraging people. <laughs> so when I saw what the Bible said, it just made me feel so good. And I could just associate it with so good. People who oppose Jesus are fools. So the Bible says they're fools. People who oppose God are fools. And when I think of a fool, I think of somebody that's just pretty stupid. Pretty stupid. It's stupid to oppose God. It's stupid to oppose Jesus. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, I love this. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. But, if you're taking notes, underline, circle, but, fools despise wisdom and discipline. That, that scripture says that wisdom belongs to people who fear God. Wisdom belongs to people who understand who God is and place him in that rightful place and fear him. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. You see, a foolish person is a person who, who is thoughtless. It's a person who is worried more about himself than anything else, self-centered, obviously, totally, completely, unequivocally indifferent to God. They're fools. I love that word. The wise run to Jesus, but the fools walk in the opposite direction. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, Only fools can say in their heart there is no God. They are corrupt, and their actions are evil, and not one of them does good. Now let's see in my loving, kind way how I say this. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus... If you're here today and you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, if you're here today and whenever you hear Jesus, you feel like running in the opposite direction, as lovingly as I can say it, stop being a freaking fool. Stop. Stop. The wise are people who follow after him. The wise are people who run after Jesus. The wise men followed after him. The wise men ran after after Jesus. I'm pretty simple. That's what the word of God says right there. That's why. Why do they run to him? Because here's why. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. When they run to him, they find life. When they run to him, they find hope. When they run to him, they find joy. When they run to him, they find what their life is lacking. We are all created and built by God with a God-shaped void. And we try to put a lot of crap in that void, and it don't work. It's not until we put God in that void does it begin to work for us. So the wise seek him, and the fools oppose him. There's one more lesson we can learn from these guys, and that's this. The spiritually-minded worship him. The spiritually-minded worship him. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9 says, after this interview, the wise men went their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. 
it went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. You see, when Herod originally told the wise men to go search carefully for this little boy, go find him and then come back, he expected it was going to take considerable time. He expected it was going to take some time, some questioning, some asking, some searching, some checking in Bethlehem in order to find this child. But that's not what happened according to the Scripture. The Scripture says when they left him, they saw the star again. It reappeared. Now, here's what I know. God inspired their journey from Jump Street. When they were in the east, wherever it was they were in the east, and they saw that star, that was God inspiring them to come. That was God inspiring them to go, okay? When they came out of this meeting with Herod, <laughs> the first thing they see is the star again. And the star, the star actually moves to over top of the house where Jesus was staying. God inspired them again to go directly to where their journey would end and be successful and be complete. But here's the thing. In verse 7, the, the word is, the word is, is uh, interpreted to mean appeared. In verse 2 and verse 9, there's a phrase they use, have seen, have seen. And when you start looking about the wise men, it says, it starts talking about the star that was in their own country, and they saw again when they got ready to leave Jerusalem. So when you think about that, they didn't follow the star like we sing about. That star stayed still. From the east, they followed it to Jerusalem, but it never moved. It stayed still. Yet, when they were in Jerusalem and finished meeting with King Herod, it says the star moved till it came over the house where the baby was, where the child was. So based on that, this ain't no ordinary star. In fact, based on this, this ain't a star at all. What this really is, I believe, was a divine revelation of light that God caused to appear. It got their attention. We all talk about there's a star in the east. No, this star was so big and so bright that it got their attention in Babylon or Persia or wherever they were, and it stayed still in the sky. It didn't move. Even as the earth rotated, it didn't move. It stayed still, and they went to Jerusalem. But when they left King Herod, it moved to where the baby was. I got to believe this was a divine revelation of light, not just some old star. And God was orchestrating all of it. It was going ahead of them. It was guiding them to the exact house that the baby was at. That to me is cool. Matthew chapter 2, verse 10 and 11 says, When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest, and then they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And no, he didn't get diapers and wipes and a purple hippo, hippo and a, a, a gallon of milk or the Jordan tennis shoes and all the other stuff. He got gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they're significant. They are majorly significant if we stop and look at it and we stop and see what God actually said and what they represent. The first gift was gold, gold, and gold represents wealth. Any king, every king should have gold, okay? It determines the value of the kingdom, right? But here's the catch. Jesus was born in poverty, and Jesus died in poverty. So why the gold? Because God wanted it to represent the king's wealth. That's all it is. But now let's go into the other two gifts because they're a little different. Frankincense. I remember as a kid, my brain disconnects. I used to think that he got gold in Frankenstein. <laughs> he got gold in a monster, you know, and Murray, whoever Murray was. But frankincense. Bet you I'm going to tell you something you don't know. It comes from a tree. It comes from a tree that only grows in that region. It's called the Arabian tree. And if you pop a hole in the, the side of that tree, like you would a maple tree, and you know how you get maple syrup? If you pop a hole in an Arabian tree, you get frankincense. It comes out as a sap, as a thick yellow sap. Now, what they do with it is they put it in a pot or they put it in a plate or something, some kind of a container, and put it in the sun. 
and it hardens almost like a brick. But you can put fire to it, and it burns. And when it burns, it lets off an aroma. It lets off an incense. It, it smells good. It's, it's an agreeable fragrance. So frankincense represents worship. Because when you went into the temple, one of the first acts of worship was to light incense to God. So frankincense represents worship. Then the third gift was myrrh. Now, myrrh comes from a tree too, but you didn't know that comes from stunted trees, trees that don't grow to full height, okay? And you go into the side of that tree, and you get this brown gunk out of it, okay? But you realize that it starts to come out. It smells good. It's got an amazing odor. In fact, it's very overpowering. That's why they used it to embalm dead bodies. Because, I mean, let's be real, a body that dies and is left alone for three or four or five days smells really, really bad. That's why a lot of times they, the tradition and the culture and the requirement was that you were buried before sundown of the next day. But the body is coated with this stuff called myrrh. It's an embalming. It's the, you know, just, there's health reasons and all kinds of stuff. But in terms of Jesus, myrrh represents something. It represents the work and the mission of Jesus. He came to this planet for one reason, to die on a cross. And that's what myrrh represents. Matthew chapter 2, verse 12 says, When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route. For God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. The, they didn't go back to Jerusalem. And why is that they didn't? Because I can guarantee you, Herod would have had them executed. Because they knew about the Messiah. And what he wanted to do was eliminate the threat. Or any person involved with the threat. So the Bible says they went back to their homeland using a different route. And they disappear from the biblical record never to be heard of again. Never. That's all we know about these guys. Now, undoubtedly, God gave them the warning. In a dream, God told them, to not go back. He was protecting the Messiah. He was protecting them. But what I think is important here, and as I think about it, is these guys, these wise guys, these seekers, they came seeking Jesus. And when they found him, they knelt down in his presence. They worshiped him. They gave him gifts. And you know, they found him because they were obedient to God. They heeded the sign. They believed the scripture. And when they found Jesus, they, their hearts were opened to him. When they found Jesus, they were never the same again. It changed their life. Let me tell you something. When you find Jesus, you will never be the same again. You will be changed if you're not changed, I'm not sure you found him. Because that's part of the process of becoming spiritually minded and worshiping him. You know, these guys worshiped him. And I thought about that. The ultimate purpose of every human being on this planet, whether we know God or not, our ult ultimate purpose is to worship God. That's what God's word says. John was was banished to an island. He was one of Jesus' followers. And because he was a follower of Jesus, he was punished, and they kind of sent him out to exile on an island. And while he was there, God gave him a vision of heaven, an amazing vision. And he wrote it all down, and it became the book of Revelation. And in that book, in chapter 5, John says, this is what he saw. Listen to this. Then I heard every creature in heaven. Listen, every creature creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. In other words, he heard every creature, whatever it was, on this planet. I heard every creature in heaven, on the earth, under the earth, and in the sea. And get this, they sang. 
Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. John says he saw all of creation worshiping God. The ultimate purpose of every creature on this planet is to worship God. To worship God. These wise men knew that. These wise men came to worship God. We were created to worship him. In fact, I told first service, if you remove every reference to worship in the Bible and every inference of worship in the Bible, there ain't much left. There ain't much left. The Bible is the owner's manual for life, and God wants us, number one, to know him, and number two, to worship him. Understand that. The Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everything that has breath Praise the Lord. The Bible also says, if we fail to worship him, the rocks and the trees will cry out. And I have said from Jump Street, I don't want to be replaced by a stinking rock. Do you? Because you know what? God's God. God's God. And we ain't. And if we don't worship him, he'll cause other parts of his creation to worship him. What a privilege he has given us. Let's not abuse it. Let's use it. God wants us to do that. You know, every Sunday morning we announce at the beginning of our service that it's time to worship. Dawn sets up here and says, let's worship God. Let's stand up and let's worship. And most of the time it's like, oh, crap, let me get up. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. Spiritually minded people worship God. We ought to jump to our feet. Well, well, those of us that can jump to our feet. We ought to jump to our feet, okay? And if you can't jump to your feet, you ought to get up. Stand up. And we ought to shout, and we ought to sing, and we ought to clap, and we ought to holler, and we ought to hoop, and we ought to dance before God. But what do we do? We sit here worried about the people that's going to watch us and not worry about the person, Jesus Christ, who's sitting on the right hand of the Father watching us. I think he's more important than Pastor Pat or Pastor David. Or, or me, or you. We're born to worship. Spiritually minded people worship. So there's a bunch of things we can learn from these wise men. Wise men seek him, fools oppose him, and we should be worshiping God. So when I get that together, this is what I come up with, a simple statement. Don't be the fool. Don't be the fool. Instead, seek him, and when you find him, worship him. Let the wise men be our example. Let's, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for who you are. You're an amazing God. And I thank you that, you that you instilled in Matthew this whole idea of helping us see that wise men seek him. Thank you for that. Father, you're an amazing God. I know that some of the folks that are in this room right now, for whatever reason, you haven't asked Jesus to come into your life. You haven't established a relationship. You haven't been wise in seeking him. Quite honestly, you've been the fool in opposing him. And you could change that. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed this afternoon. We don't know when we will take our last breath on this planet. But as long as we're breathing, we have the choice. The moment we take our last breath, it's sealed in eternity. And if we've chosen not to ask him into our life, the Bible clearly says you will spend eternity in hell with Satan. I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that. If I'm going to spend eternity anywhere, I want to be with Jesus. It's so easy for you because God did all the work. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. All you've got to do is ask him to come into your life. I'm going to say a short prayer. If you've never prayed this prayer, I want you to pray it with me. If you've said this prayer before, I encourage you to pray it with me also. It goes like this. It's, God, I need you. I need you so much. I'm a sinner. I have fallen short every single day, and I'm tired of doing this by myself. I don't want to be a fool no more. I want you to come into my life. I want you to establish a relationship with me this day. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you went to the grave, and I believe you rose again for me to be the perfect sacrifice for my sin. And I want a relationship with you right now, and I want to spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer, he answered it, and you are now a child of the king. Amen? 
Amen.